Hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I'm Dr. Carolyn Alexander. It's an honor to be here with my sweetheart, dear friend, Tamara. How, how are you today? Hi, Dr. Alexander. I'm happy to be here today. Um, we've done this before in a much shorter form, so I'm excited to um, talk with you and talk with the people about um, how to handle IVF during the holidays and answer questions and things like that. Yes, and I think it's, it's such a um, interesting time in the world, and I always take a moment to kind of get centered and for everybody listening in, I, I, we both send good energy. Both of us are super dedicated and compassionate and, and really um, focus our energy on helping people through their journey on egg freezing and fertility. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised. I went to UCLA for undergrad and medical school. My research and passion has been about polycystic ovary syndrome and as well as recurrent pregnancy loss. And I'm working closely with oncologists for patients who face cancer and need to urgently think about fertility and their options. I trained on the East Coast, so I lived in Baltimore for a long time. And it's been an honor and a privilege to work with such a wonderful team here. I have Jayla, Amber, Ariel, Ellie, and they're just very dedicated and good spirited with everything we do. And at SCRC, we're many physicians. We work closely together. We talk a lot about complex cases and try to put all our heads together and give uh, a lot of support to all our patients. And I know how much you're dedicated because I see you here often and I'd love to hear about you. Sure. Uh, my name is Tamara Zumalin, and I am originally from Chicago. I, I was just talking with Cece about uh, how we ended up here, and um, she came for college, and I came here right after college. I told my parents, I'm, I'm um, one of many children, and I told my parents that I was going to go live in Los Angeles for a year, and that was in 2000, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was in 1992, and so we see how that worked out. I, I, I never went back, um, and a few years in living in Los Angeles, I decided to get my acupuncture degree. So I did that. I did the, the four-year program to get a master's. And then after I'd been in practice for a while, I went back and I completed the doctorate portion with a specialization on the effect of acupuncture on IVF outcomes. So that's how I've done so much close work with uh, SCRC and, and, and fertility clinics. Um, I serve as a subject matter expert for the State, State Board of California and um, help write the exam now for people who want to be acupuncturist. And I've been in practice for 22 years. I'm just one block over from SCRC and I've been in my Beverly Hills office for 12 years now. Fantastic. Um, our embryology facility has been here for over 25 years. And um, we're very proud that we've had eggs that have been frozen for over 12 years make healthy babies, which is a, a really big triumph. Um, we have an on-site surgery center. Our lab is here in Beverly Hills. We also have a sister embryology lab in Santa Barbara. And our um, Pasadena office is fantastic, filled with amazing teammates who work hard every day there, seven days a week dedicated to all the patients. Next slide. What sets our lab apart is we have experienced and certified directors, a double witnessing verification system. We do flash freezing or vitrification for both embryos as well as eggs, which is the most advanced way to freeze um, eggs and embryos. And we do a 24 chromosome genetic testing as well as if needed sex selection. We were one on the, of the first on the West Coast to get a time-lapse morphokinetics machine called the embryoscope. And what's interesting, it, it helped us give a lot more information about the embryos. I wish it could change genetics, it can't, but it can at least provide some more information and data points for patients who are really trying to understand which embryo could be a little bit better than the other embryo. Next slide. Um, today, we're going to talk about navigating the holidays. I know how, how sometimes busy and hectic and lots of um, family pressures can pop up, and we'll talk a little bit about that, how to prepare for 
egg freezing, embryo freezing in the process. A lot of men are talking about sperm freezing. I saw two last week, 45 year old men who are ready to freeze some sperm. They're not ready to start a family. And so there's a, a lot of movement on optimization for future fertility. We'll talk about mental health and ways to really focus your energy on what you can control because it's always um, a little hard, especially now to like, it's too much to think of everything at once. So I say one step at a time. And, and I know Tamara is amazing at stress management, our success rates. We'll talk about meeting our team, special offers, and, and we're open to any questions. So anyone who puts in questions in the chat, we tend to answer them towards the end. Thank you. So navigating the holidays, next slide. Um, especially during the holidays, some, pe some people aren't able to maybe travel and see their family or um, their family lives abroad and things are um, not, they're not able to get there, but feelings of loneliness and grief. A lot of my patients I notice sometimes are really focused on um, the past. And I always say we have to look forward to the future. It's too hard on all of us as human beings to really have the looking back on the past, but the uncomfortable questions from family, when are you going to get pregnant? Why didn't you freeze your eggs yet? I know all those questions because I got pregnant in my late thirties and into 40. And so I understand because I'm from a big family and I, I felt a lot of those pressures myself. So when patients, um, comment or say it. I always stay quiet and think to myself, I totally understand, you know, eh. and then I try to tune into what the person needs in that moment. Um, it Christmas or the holidays for Hanukkah and Christmas and every, every holiday we're surrounded by children and many family events. And so it feels a little overwhelming sometimes. So it's important to talk about it. I I'm a big believer in talking about it, not suppressing the feelings and really either journaling or power of visualization or anything that suits you. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, Tamara. That's a really great, a, a great point. And I also like you see people around December um, come in and they're, they don't want to see their families and they for this very reason, they don't want to have to answer all of the uncomfortable questions. And I do have a couple of uh, responses that I have offered to my clientele to say when people do ask, when are you going to start a family? And here are my two favorites. When somebody says, when are you going to start a family? Smile and say, you know, that's a really great question. How did you decide when to start a family? People love to talk about themselves. So they're going to tell you all about their quest for fertility. And then you say, great, thanks. I'm going to take all that into consideration. And my other response that works really well is when somebody says, hey, when are you guys going to start a family? You can say, you know, we're just taking life as it comes right now, but as soon as we have information, we're going to let you know right away, probably going to call you first and, you know, just say it like in a joking way. So that person feels really important. And then those two uh, answers do tend to uh, stop that conversation. And as we're playing with the children, play with the children. It's they're, they're fun. Get on the floor, um, get some kid vibes around you and, and feel good about that. Now, you talk about journaling um, during that time, and I love journaling. I love journaling so much that I put journaling space in my, my book that I just wrote, um, because I do want you to journal every day. I want you to put it down on paper at the end of the day, the things that went well, the positive steps you made, the things that you might want to change tomorrow, and, and just be really proud of yourself that you made it through another day in fertility, because sometimes the, the, that's, um, it's not, it's not, going as quickly as you want it to, or you may have to correct course in your treatments and things like that. And if you can get that down on paper, you're going to feel a little bit better about it. And I try to send each patient an action plan. And I feel like that helps me to kind of stay focused on one piece of the puzzle at the at a time. And mm -hmm. we put in everyone's thoughts and energy. Our embryology director is from New York. He's very opinionated, loud, and talks to us and we have these um, interesting conversations about ways to get the, a better fertilization rate and think it through together. So it does feel like it's such a uh, group effort, you know, putting everybody's minds together and really trying to be there with you all through the process. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to do this one? <laughs> 
Oh, sure. Coping with the holidays, our recommendations to patients, um, taking a break from social media. Absolutely. We all know how the algorithm works. So if you see um, pregnancy and um, tips on being pregnant during the holidays and all that, you're going to start getting more of those, especially on platforms like TikTok and Instagram. So don't... Um, don't get uh, uh, too bogged down with looking at those things during the holidays because the algorithm will find you with all of the pregnancy stuff and maybe even ads about how to uh, become pregnant faster and things like that. And we don't want that at that time. Um, start your own little holiday traditions as a couple. I love this one. Tree trimming, get each other an ornament, um, um, Hanukkah presents, things like that, that you only you do together, um, that, that would be out of the ordinary what you do with your family. And it's okay to say no to events when you just don't feel comfortable attending. You can do that, absolutely. And I say this one about baby showers as well. You are under no obligation to go to that sort of thing if it's not comfortable for you at that time. Um, and share your feelings with your support system, absolutely. And I have an all vibes welcome approach in my office. Bring it. Whatever you're feeling today, I want to hear about it. If we're if we're having a victorious day, fantastic. If we're having a I feel defeated day, we're going to talk that through. And hopefully after you talk it through with me or your therapist or somebody who is on your support system for your feelings, you'll, you'll be doing a little bit better. Um, plan responses for uncomfortable conversations ahead of time. And that's where I love my one. That's a great question. Um, when did you start a family? How did you decide when to start a family and let that person tell you all about their journey and then uh, um, and just wrap it up at that and take care of yourself and do activities that bring you happiness. We all know those things that bring us happiness. Um, for me, it's yoga. For some people, it's long walks and hiking and Pilates or pickleball is a big one right now. So some of my patients are playing pickleball to blow off some steam and get the endorphins flowing and, and, and feel good about themselves. And I know in fertility, we like walking. We like uh, for the ladies to take walks every day. So that's another one too. And involve your partner. Involve your partner in all those activities as well. IVF prepared preparation in the process. So we take a detailed medical history. We really tune in. I'm noticing a lot of men who are on medications that might impact sperm DNA fragmentation as well as their motility. And so it's really important to take a deep medical dive into both partners and trying to understand the menstrual cycle, how it, when you were in, going through puberty, were you an early bloomer, late bloomer? We really take a super detailed medical history. We're trying to find any subtle causes of something called endometriosis, which is sometimes a hidden culprit with infertility, as well as um, some patients they don't have all the appearance of polycystic ovary syndrome, but they may have atypical PCOS or lean PCOS. And so it's important to think that through. It's important to make sure you're up to date with your pap smear. If you're at the age for mammogram, if you're past 45, also colonoscopy, just to shout that out to remind people what um, we do see a lot of patients in their mid forties ready to start a family and it's important to think about their general health. We do a physical exam. Um, we're noticing a lot more thyroid nodules. I think I just caught two in the last few weeks. So it's important to do a good physical exam and the diagnostic testing, which we're going to talk about. I love this picture. So people always ask, how come I'm not getting pregnant? Well, I try to think it is ovulation happening. Is the fallopian tube open? Is the uterus an environment where the embryo would want to attach? Could there be autoimmune disruption, blood clotting disorders? Are you severely anemic from fibroids? And when we're really anemic, the body's like, why should we get pregnant? It's, I'm so anemic. I don't have enough iron for myself than to have a baby. So the system has a, an awareness as well, as well as when your cortisol is really high and you're super stressed and not sleeping well, the uterus has extra contractility. So the embryo gets to the uterus and is trying to latch on, but the uterus is kind of in a, in a state of fight or flight. Next slide. It's important to test the hormone levels. AMH is not a perfect test. It's called anti-malarian hormone level. It's a test that we use as a tool 
um, to guide us to understand the egg supply. On your second, third, or fourth day of your period, we test a pituitary hormone, which is the control gland in your brain, the FSH, follicle stimulating hormone level in conjunction with estradiol. They're not useful independently, they're done together and they help us understand uh, are the egg quality levels hitting the targets. Also, they can ebb and flow. So some people come in super disheartened. There's these home tests that a lot of patients are coming in saying, I, I don't know what to do. My levels are bad. And then sometimes we'll recheck them and they're decent. So you always have to take things with a grain of salt. In general, we want the AMH from a 26 to 29 year old to be, I would say two to six and then 30 to 35, 1.5 and above is ideal. 36 to 39, ideally above one, but 1 1.5 is kind of our hope for then. And then 40 to 44 is, is a little bit of an interesting time because we've had patients have a 0.03 level, which you would think is so unbelievably low and we can get them pregnant. So it's not always um, a automatic um, doomsday when the level is low. It just means it might be harder to finesse the golden egg to come forward. And then the ovary looks here like a little chocolate chip cookie. Each black circle has one microscopic egg the size of a grain of salt. And we're hoping to see five to 10 follicles on each ovary. Some of our patients have been on birth control pills for years. They'll come in and we'll only see two or three follicles on each side. We'll give them a month breather off the pill and lo and behold, they have 10 and 10 on each side. And so it's important to know that it, it's not a one viewpoint. We have to take things over time and understand your body for your specific situation. Next slide. The male testing is very important. There's the traditional semen analysis as well as the sperm DNA fragmentation testing. Um, the volume should be over two milliliters. The concentration should be over 20 million per milliliter. Motility, which is how fast they're swimming, should be over 50%. This is impacted by sauna, jacuzzi, long bike rides, maybe even putting our phone or computer right on our lap for a long time, long days at work because overheat on the testicles and it impact this, as well as some medications and thyroid problems. We've caught some men with high prolactin, thyroid issues, testosterone issues. The morphology is really beautiful to look at the shape of the head, the mid piece and the tail. The mid piece is where the mitochondria are, and that's where CoQ10 or ubiquinol improves mitochondrial function in sperm and eggs. And so it's important to recognize that some of the supplements have a beneficial effect. And especially it, feel, it feels like you're trying to improve even if your morphology is borderline. Again, we don't trust one viewpoint of a semen analysis. We have to reevaluate. The bottom portion has two tails and two heads, and those are harder to hyper mobility to get into the egg. The sperm has to wiggle its way through the zona pellucida to get into the egg. And so when the morphology is compromised from marijuana, CBD oil, plastic pollution, a lot of fried food and processed foods have impact on this too. It's important to take a step back. Nutrition's over seven days. One day, Friday night to have fun and do what you want is not the end of the world. But over the rest of the days of the week, you want to try to be as clean and healthy as you can be. Half the battle for a good embryo is the sperm. And so we are checking more on the sperm DNA fragmentation. We have a new chip where the sperm swims through an obstacle course to get to the other end, and that's called the zymot. And what's kind of magical is the ones that get to the other end have 9% better DNA, but we can't utilize that tool if the original sperm concentration volume are too low. And so that's always a little disheartening. People are like, I want to try everything. I want to improve everything. So do we, but our hands are tied. If the original sample that day is compromised, it's harder for us to use some of the tools we have to help you. 
Next slide. The benefits of nutrition I'll have you take this one, Tamara. You know, I like this one. And I um, This is what I do in my clinic, my clinic program. Um, um, just a, a little bit about me. Every time somebody comes in for a, a new patient consultation and I ask all the questions, then we do the acupuncture and then I go home and I make a grocery list and some do's and some don'ts and some things that are specific to that person and her partner. So this is very, very important to me. And I um, became certified as a Chinese medical nutritionist early in my training for this very reason because you can have all the acupuncture in the world, but if you're not eating correctly and not doing all the things on this list, uh, we, we're not gonna get there as quickly as we want to. Um, so this says uh, vitamins and nutrients linked to positive effect on fertility, uh, diets like the Mediterranean, of course, uh, folic acid for um, egg quality and um, early spinal cord development, vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids, and you know, your recommended supplement list is exactly what mine is, a good prenatal vitamin to fill in the gaps of any nutritional deficiencies, uh, CoQ10 to get the mitochondria uh, fresh that keeps the eggs um, energetic. What we say in Chinese medicine is it, it, it ups the young energy of the egg and vitamin D for follicular health. And help me with this one. I don't have the study in front of me, but it, um, you might remember this one, Dr. Alexander, um, you know, it, a, a woman who is low in vitamin D, if she increases her vitamin D so that it is now between 50 and 65, and these numbers might be a little off, um, if she increases her vitamin D into a better range, um, she will have more follicles. Now, if she already has a good vitamin D, we want vitamin D extra for other reasons, um, but if her vitamin D is within range, it won't give her more follicles, but if it's low and you take it, then yes, it would. So we do have the same list, a good prenatal vitamin to fill in the nutritional gaps, um, CoQ10 for the mitochondria and vitamin D for the follicular health and for the sperm health as well. It's really important. A paper came out about sperm quality and vitamin D to hit at least 40. So I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, we, I try not to put too much pressure on the pit on everybody, but I think just taking the vitamin D with your toothbrush, because sometimes people are like, I forgot, but it take it when you brush your teeth, you remember, let me take my vitamins too. If you're taking thyroid medicine, though, remember that that one, you can't take a vitamin for about six hours or so, but double check with your doctor too. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to avoid toxins. Excessive alcohol is not ideal. So I usually say the month before, up to three months before IVF, to think to do two glasses of wine a week, not hard alcohol. And then when you're on the protocol, which is a approximately 12, 10 to 12 days, you really want to avoid alcohol during that time. But for men, it actually is 72 days. And so I have a lot of men asking me exactly how many days they have to avoid alcohol. I always say one or two glasses of wine a week is probably reasonable, but hard alcohol or excessive alcohol for both the egg and sperm quality is not ideal. Mm -hmm. Cannabis, CBD, oil vaping, is also very complex because I have a lot of patients ask me, show me the evidence. I don't know if you get asked that too, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on cannabis. I, I give it the no. I want you to have no cannabis. And when I do write out your instructions, I specifically say no cannabis, no alcohol, and no tobacco. Now, I don't mind if you're going to raise a glass in celebration of alcohol. If you're having a, a glass of wine and you're in an event, that's fine. Um, but I say zero. In a perfect world, we're going to do zero of these things. No alcohol, no cannabis, and no tobacco. And yeah. um, and, and, and that's how we'll handle that. Now with the holidays coming up, I imagine my patients are going to be a little more lax and I do want them to celebrate a little bit, but definitely no cannabis and no tobacco, maybe a little. Yeah. I, I tend to think of it like preparing for the Olympics. You're, if you're really working a hard to goal, it's it, and you've had that and enjoyed it in the past, or if you needed it for sleep or muscle joint things, I understand, but ultimately it's safer to avoid it, um, especially tobacco with the higher risk of blood clotting for both men and women, especially with a flight and tobacco, that's a high risk for a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. But tobacco also reduces AMH, which is your egg supply level and the follicle count. So I explain to patients, cut it down by half, 
wait a week, see how you're doing. Most people are like, I felt fine on it. And then I'm like, cut it down by half again and then cut it down again. And then I'm trying to get them to just stop. Um, there's also Chantix with your primary care doctor for tobacco. A lot of men appreciate when I talk about that because then they tried it and then they don't have the craving as much for nicotine. So it's really kind of, there are a lot of options out there to optimize your health and it's good for when the baby's gonna come soon, hopefully. So <laughs> next yeah. slide. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, so the egg retrieval timeline. So I think of it as um, depending if we're going to use a, a protocol with birth control pills or no birth control pills. But ultimately, the medications are follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, growth hormone, and a GnRH antagonist. And each of these meds has a purpose. Sometimes we use a GnRH agonist, but ultimately you're getting monitoring about five or six ultrasounds and blood tests over 10 to 12 days. You do feel breast tenderness, headache, mood swings, thirsty. And during that time, you have to drink two liters of water a day, avoid white carbs, make sure to take a walk every day to keep your circulation moving, but no jogging, no elliptical, no intercourse is allowed, no aspirin or, or Excedrin, which is like full dose aspirin is allowed during that time. And then we do an egg retrieval, which is around a 15 to 20 minute procedure through the vagina under sedation. And we carefully get the eggs out. I always think which one could be a baby to be in. So we're very careful with these precious um, eggs. And then our embryology team, which is right behind there, they work hard to clean off the eggs and make sure to either flash freeze them or fertilize them depending on the plan. Down here is an image of the transvaginal ultrasound with the needle. It actually, the ovary ends up being really close in proximity. And then we carefully go in with the bevel of the needle, which is the white line on the bottom right into the middle of the follicle and we drain the follicle and the egg is in the cumulus area and we carefully get the egg out. Next slide. This is a beautiful image of the egg and the ICSI process where we're placing the sperm in and then pulling back a little cytoplasm, then placing the sperm, we've immobilized the sperm. And now the sperm is in the egg and we're hoping to see two pronuclei the next day. Next slide. And embryo development is very beautiful. You see a fertilized egg begins as two cells, then four cells, then eight cells, 16 to 32 to a morula, which is a ball of cells, and then to the blastocyst, which is over a hundred cells. We're able to take three or four cells from the perimeter to check for genetic screening for aneuploidy or a specific gene like cystic fibrosis Tay-Sachs. I already saw one of the questions, which I think is fascinating for whole genome sequencing. We've done it here. It's not standard of care. So it's a little bit complex. So you really have to understand what the data is going to provide for us. So it would um, need a bigger discussion than this, but, um, and there's a company that can kind of go over the genetics of it and explain the whole genome sequencing. But traditionally we do next generation sequencing, which looks at all the chromosomes. And if a patient carries BRCA, cystic fibrosis, or any genetic issue that we need to um, check. If it's autosomal recessive, both partners carry it. If it's autosomal dominant, one person, the partner or you carry it, and we can determine which embryo is affected. We're hoping to get a healthy embryo. Once we've overcome these tests, what's really magical and beautiful is there's around a 65 to 75% chance that the embryo can latch on and implant and then a five to 9% chance of miscarriage after that. But when we get pregnant naturally, like I was older and pregnant, you brace yourself because you don't know the risk of chromosome problems or the risk of miscarriage because it, it can be quite high, especially if you're in your forties. Next slide. Your turn. <laughs> Mental health and stress. Um, I 
mental health during IVF, oh, 50% of women have symptoms of clinical depression while going through fertility treatments. I like to have my patients also have a therapist on board and some uh, already have one and some I will refer on to my network. Um, I think that that's very important. 70 per, 76% of women and 61% of men have symptoms of clinical anxiety while going through infertility. Acupuncture, fantastic there because we all know Anxiety will lead you to other things. It'll lead you to digestive problems. It will lead you to sleep problems. It will lead you to not be able to function throughout your day. So certainly getting um, a handle on that with acupuncture is very helpful. I do have a, a, um, a list of, of uh, point combinations that I use for that. And 75% of people going through infertility treatments report feeling some depressed or anxious during the holiday season. I'm going to say that's pretty accurate at 75%. And I think it might be higher of people who just aren't telling me that they want to put on a stoic face for their families. Um, and I think it might even be a little bit higher. So certainly acupuncture, um, getting good sleep, finding the activities that you love, those things are helpful at that time, just to help you cope and get over the hump. Because I don't want you to avoid the holidays altogether. And I don't want you to dread the holidays altogether. And uh, next Christmas, you'll probably have a baby in your arm. So that's something to think about too. Um, the holistic approach of acupuncture, nutrition, and meditation, that's that's pretty much what I do here in my clinic program. Um, the reason that you have acupuncture is uh, while you are, are going through IVF are three specific reasons. One, we want to get good blood flow to the ovaries and to the uterus. Two, we want to influence the HPO axis, that's the hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovarian axis, and how those organs and glands communicate with each other to produce hormones. Acupuncture and, and nutrition, very helpful there. And the third reason that you would have an acupuncturist while you're going through IVF is to uh, uh, decrease cortisol and increase endorphins and acupuncture and diet, very helpful there. Now, when you are having acupuncture, you rest with your needles in for about 25 minutes. And I do put on meditative music and people do use that as a time to meditate. So it's also a great respite for, for you during the day to come by and have acupuncture. Um, and I am one block over from Dr. Alexander. So a lot of our patients piggyback their appointments. They'll come here and then go there or they'll see her and then come here. Uh, so that's something to think about too, the proximity of our practices. Acupuncture can improve sleep, reduce stress, improve blood flow. That's what I was just talking about. The improving blood flow to the ovaries is incredibly important. I also like to use um, infrared heat on the lower abdomen while you are going through IVF. Um, you know, just relaxing the muscles, getting the good blood flow to the, what we call in Chinese medicine, the lower jiao, which is the reproductive organs and um, can also uh, balance hormones, that's right, influence the HPO axis, reduce stress, and like I said, by way of increasing endorphins and lowering cortisol, and increase pregnancy rates by 16.2% during embryo transfers. That's true, um, and I like to recommend that you have acupuncture on the day of your transfer, either coming to your acupuncture before the transfer or having somebody on site with you at the fertility clinic. Oh, someone asked a question about what are safe, like face creams during an embryo transfer. I tend to say, just don't use the same thing every day. Cause there might be an accumulation of a toxin that we don't understand. And, um, also trying to pick natural. It's a little confusing with what's natural and what's not. Um, because sometimes the things that say natural may not really be fully natural. So I, I think over exposure for the same Thing every day during that early embryogenesis window is the most concerning thing. So what I would do is like every couple of days switch types of things, but I, my, my skin gets dry. So I needed, um, some things when I was pregnant and I just tried to minimize kind of globbing unnecessary things on that you may not really need, you know, you need a good cleanser and then the good um, moisturizer, um, but sunscreen, cause otherwise you get these little raccoon eyes and so when you're pregnant, especially and on all the hormones during the embryo transfer protocol. Another patient asked uh, about travel here. We say we don't let people travel too much after the transfer for at least that first four to seven days. But um, in the past before COVID, we actually did a little sub analysis of people 48 hours and then they could travel and they would go far like all over the world. 
and the pregnancy rate was the same. But typically they'd get back to home base and not travel after that. So it wasn't like to travel for like a, a travel trip. Even stewardesses who are early pregnant aren't allowed to travel too, too much because of your closer to the sun and exposure to ray, x-rays and stuff, stuff like that. So um, not, not too much. I don't know if that answers the person's question, but that was, that was a good question. You know, um, coconut oil, I know it seems to be the cure-all for everything right now, but some of my patients use coconut oil as a moisturizer and it just takes a, a tiny, tiny bit goes a long way. That's one to try as well. And it, everybody's different, but see if that one works for you because I think that's safe. Yeah. And then when you're just finished your embryo transfer, you don't really want to do color because that smell and that, you know, all those things are not ideal in that window of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very proud of our team here. I love them each and every one, every one of us. It works really hard. We're very dedicated. We're committed to helping all our patients. And so all of us are available to see patients and talk things over. I'm proud of our success rates. We've worked hard. We have these really detailed scientific meetings trying to improve our protocols and and checklists and making sure we do the best we can. And it's an open discussion with patients. I had a patient today bring three articles. She wanted to go over them. They were really interesting, very unique things that she wanted to think about, try, talk about the pros and cons. So we're very open-minded to be as proactive as you need us to be and um, guide you through the process. And I, it's an honor to work with someone so nice like you mm. too. And oh, we have fantastic fall promotions. Feel free to tap in on any of these things. They're all on our websites and um, it's a fantastic group. Mm -hmm. It really is. I, I was just telling this to Dr. Suri a couple of weeks ago when my uh, my book was published and I brought him a signed copy and I wanted to tell him because I don't think I'd ever told him this. He was the very first person to send me a fertility patient in about the year 2006. So that's when I met Dr. Suri and I knew who he was and I just couldn't believe that he had sent me a patient. So that's how I got my start as a fertility acupuncturist. And I don't think I I had ever shared that with him. So um, uh, that was our conversation that day. One of the questions was, you know, about the whole genome sequencing and Dr. Suri has a lot of information about that for whoever asked that question too. And a common question that we're usually asked is how many eggs do I need for a baby? And so we did look at that. Our average age of patients is 39, but we're noticing more patients coming before 35 to think about egg freezing because our eggs are much stronger when we're before 35 because the mitotic spindle inside the egg gets really sticky. And so it's important to talk it out with your doctor and try to get a sense on um, statistics and the odds and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to see you today and I wish everybody a healthy journey ahead. I, I guess one more question came in. I, that last question, I'm, maybe Brittany can get us the answer and we can answer you back. It's about, are the it, consults in person? Some people are doing in person and some, the Zoom has been nice because they, we don't have to wear the two masks and the goggles and everything with uh, the, but in a lot of us are still also able to do it in person as well if needed too. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone for, for uh, coming today. That was, that was fun. Yeah. yeah.